Before we get to our main topic for today, which is plant responses to the environment, I wanted to point out that there's a section of your textbook that you guys are responsible for covering on your own, and that is vegetative reproduction, which is basically a fancy term for the asexual reproduction of plants. Uh, so this is in your textbooks on page 564, so make sure that you review that at some point. Uh, we won't be discussing it in class, but it is good material for the final exam. And now for our main topic of the day. This is coming from chapter 25.2 in the textbook, and we're talking about how plants manage to respond to changes in the environment. And one way that plants do that is they use hormones. And hopefully you guys remember the definition of a hormone from your reading, but a hormone is a chemical produced in one location that causes a response somewhere, other, somewhere else in the organism. Uh, one more time, a hormone is a chemical produced in one location that causes a response somewhere else in the organism. So humans have hormones as well. Uh, if you think about, for example, testosterone, that's a really commonly known hormone. Testosterone is produced in one location in the male body, but then it has effects all over. So for example, testosterone is what's responsible for the deepening of the voice and for the hair growth that males experience during puberty, which occurs all over the body. It's all the result of one hormone. So plants have some hormones as well, and these are the five classes of hormones that we'll be discussing today uh, that are active in plants. So let's take a look at how they work. The first group of plant hormones we'll discuss are called auxins. Auxins are growth hormones, so they promote plant growth. One thing that's cool about auxins is that they're contained inside the seeds of, of plants. And so here we have a normal strawberry, and you can see all of the seeds here on the outside. And this is a healthy strawberry because all of these seeds contain auxins, so they're promoting the growth of the fruit. But here's a strawberry that's had all of its seeds removed. Notice it's not growing. There's no, it's not a healthy strawberry here because all those auxins that were contained inside the seeds are absent. And so the strawberry really hasn't grown at all. And here we have sort of a, a halfway plant. This is a strawberry with sort of a, a strip of the seeds that have been removed. And you can see that around that strip, the strawberry is really undergrown. Whereas in areas that are around seeds that are producing auxin, the strawberry is growing very well. So you can see that auxins are very, very important uh, to the growth of fruits. They're also really important in helping plants to grow tall. If you think about plants, one of their primary objectives is to get to sunlight, have access to the sun. And in order to do that, they really need to grow tall. So auxin helps plants to grow tall. The trade-off, though, is that the lateral buds, the buds that grow on the sides of stems and would make the plant bushy, don't grow in the presence of auxins. And so if you want your plant to grow bushy, let's say that you have a rose bush, for example, and instead of just having a few very tall st uh, shoots, you'd like to have a bushier plant, what you can do is actually remove the central bud, or the top bud, and what that does is it allows the lateral buds to grow more and your plant becomes bushier. So if any of you have ever pruned a rose bush, uh, this is why you did it. You, you removed the top buds to cut off the auxins, which then allowed the lateral buds to really flourish and made your plant bushier. The next group of plant hormones that we'll discuss are called cytokinins, and cytokinins stimulate cell division which is really a, a cool feature. Um, it's also been shown to slow down the aging process in some plants. And so florists will use cytokinins. They'll actually spray these hormones onto cut flowers in order to let them last longer. And in fact, cytokinins are also sprayed on the fruits and vegetables that we buy at the grocery store because they prolong their shelf lives. The next class of plant hormones is called gibberellins, and these have a, a pretty wide array of effects. Some gibberellins make stems grow longer, so they make your plants grow taller, and some help in the development of fruits and seeds. And what's pretty cool is gibberellins, again, are very commercially important because they're used on fruits to, to enlarge them. So almost all the grapes that you buy in the grocery store have been enlarged using extra amounts of gibberellins. 
Now, you remember that gibberellins and the other plant hormones we talked about, cytokinins, these are natural plant hormones. It's just that sometimes a little bit extra is sprayed on the plant in order to make them bigger. So these grapes have been sprayed with gibberellins. You'll see they're much larger than the smaller grapes that have not been stimulated with gibberellins. And our next plant hormone is called abscisic acid. And abscisic acid is what's called a stress hormone. It helps plants that are under some kind of environmental stress. Think, for example, of a seed that's just been formed. And maybe conditions aren't so favorable for that seed. Maybe it's really dry in the environment, and so the seed won't grow. Uh, abscisic acid will prevent the seed from starting to grow before the conditions become more favorable. And that's a really important feature because it ensures the survival of the young seed and makes it more likely that a healthy plant will grow. Um, under dry conditions for a larger plant, for a plant, that, plant that's further along in its development, abscisic acid will cause the stomata to close. Now, what normally leaves through the stomata? Of course, water vapor. Water vapor usually leaves the plant's stomata uh, in the process called transpiration. But abscisic acid will cause the stomata to close, will cause those guard cells to close over the stomata in the event that there are re there's really dry weather. So we talked about stomata, and we talked about the fact that stomata close, but it's new that abscisic acid can actually is the hormone that's responsible for that. And finally, the last plant hormone that we're going to discuss is called ethylene. Ethylene is actually a gas. It's, it's the only non-liquid plant hormone that we're discussing. And it promotes, it promotes the ripening of fruits. So, for example, um, let's say that we have a tomato growing on the vine here. Uh, this tomato will produce some ethylene. And that ethylene will be released, remember it's a gas, and it'll make contact with other nearby tomatoes on the same vine so that now those tomatoes will start to ripen as well. So here we have a pretty cool experiment. This is some mistletoe, and right now it's growing very healthily. It's got a, a nice supply of water, and it seems very happy, very healthy. And then we put a rotting apple inside the container with uh, the mistletoe. And Apples are known for producing a lot of ethylene, and now the mistletoe is starting to rot because of the presence of the ethylene that's being produced by that, by that apple. So this is actually, this was relevant to me a few months ago because I needed to buy a new um, fruit bowl for my kitchen, and I decided to get one that had open sides on it so that it wasn't a solid bowl, but it was actually more of like a, a basket. And the reason for that is I like apples, but if you put in a lot of other fruits with your apples, then the apples will actually cause those other fruits to go bad sooner. And so I, I bought this open basket that allows some of that ethylene to leak out so that the other fruits don't go bad so quickly. So that summarizes the five plant hormones that we're discussing. Now let's talk about how plants respond to sudden changes in their environments. Um, this is called tropisms, the, the way that plants respond. So let's take a look at three different kinds of, of tropisms. The first is called heliotropism. Heliotropism um, is a response to helio, which is the sun. It's sometimes called phototropism. Now, a tropism is some kind of a change in plant growth in response to a stimulus in a certain direction. Again, a tropism is a change in plant growth in response to a stimulus in a certain direction. So very often, plants will want to grow towards light, towards the sun, because they need that light for photosynthesis. And so they will grow towards the sun. They'll sense the sun, and then they'll grow towards it. And that we call a positive tropism, because the plant is growing towards the stimulus. Thigmotropism is another example of a positive tropism that plants show. Some plants need to grow against 
strong materials. So think about ivy, for example, or this here is a grapevine. Uh, these kinds of plants d aren't strong enough to support themselves, and so they grew by wrapping around stronger structures. Sometimes it's trees or some other kind of plant, and in this case it's wire. So this plant, as it's growing, will actually shoot out its tendrils, and the tendrils, as soon as they detect something, will grow and wrap around it. So you can see that the tendrils are wrapping around this strong wire here. That's a positive tropism because it's responding, the plant is responding to its sense of touch and it grows, it grows towards what it's touching. Gravitropism is a really cool tropism because you can see both positive gravitropism and negative gravitropism in things like trees. So a plant responding to gravity, if it's showing positive gravitropism, will actually grow downward in the direction of gravity. Again, positive tropism, excuse me, positive gravitropism means that a plant's, plant will grow downwards in the direction of gravity. So what part of a plant would grow downward? That's right, the roots. So roots on a tree show positive gravitropism. But not the whole tree grows downward, otherwise trees would live underground, right? The shoots of a tree actually grow upward. So what kind of a tropism are the shoots showing? Well, they're showing a negative gravitropism because they're growing away from the force of gravity. So let's look at some examples of these tropisms in action. Here we have phototropism. These are some tomato plants. And you'll notice that they're kind of growing they tend to be leaning to the right here, but we've just placed them in this area near a window, and the window is over here on the left. So let's look at what happens to these tomato plants over a period of a few hours. You'll see they're detecting the light. Watch that. You see how their leaves are reorienting towards the light? So these plants are trying to maximize their access to the light, and they're doing it using positive phototropism. And you see how the direction the plants were growing actually changed. So this is important for me because I have a lot of plants at home, and I know that if I keep them in my window for too long, just facing the same direction, they'll all start to look kind of crooked because they all grow towards the light. So if you keep plants in your window, it's best to rotate them every now and again so that you don't get plants that look really crooked. Here are a couple other examples of plants exhibiting tropisms. Let's look at the one on the left here. So these are some bean plants. Oh, how much fun, there's music there. Here we have the roots. These are again showing ne excuse me, positive gravitropism because they're growing down in the direction of gravity. And the shoots, you'll notice, are showing negative gravitropism. They're growing up, away from gravity. That's kind of irritating. Ah, huh, that's better. So again, in a plant, you can see both positive gravitropism in the roots and negative gravitropism in the shoots. This plant here is a vine. It's called a morning glory vine. And look at how this is growing. This is, of course, in time lapse. But you see how the vine is shooting around? What it's doing is it's looking for something to attach to. And it can't find anything just yet, but pretty soon it's going to hit one of those sticks on the side. Oh, there it goes. And as soon as it detects something it can attach, attach to, it starts growing in that direction. And so now the tendrils are wrapping around this stick here. So that's positive thigmotropism. Another way that plants respond to their environments, aside from tropisms, is by responding to the lengths of days. So we're all familiar with the fact that during the winter, the days are much shorter than they are during the summer, uh, which is not to say that days aren't 24 hours, but the periods of light and dark are very different. In the summer, you can stay out until 7 or even 8 o'clock at night, and it's still pretty light outside. You don't really need too many lights. Whereas in the winter, it starts to get dark even around 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And so the days are much shorter during the winter, and, and plants actually respond to that. There are what are called short-day plants. And short-day plants, like the poinsettia, for example, flower 
when the days are shortest. So if you have, for example, a, a really long night, like a 16-hour period of darkness, the short day plant will start to flower. That's why poinsettias are so popular around Christmas time is because that's when they start to flower and they start to look beautiful. During the summer, poinsettias are still healthy plants, but they're not flowering because the days are too long and the periods of night are too short. The opposite of true is excuse me, the opposite of true is true of what we call long day plants, like irises. Irises um, flower during longer days and they flower less during shorter days. So what's cool about this is that if you run a commercial greenhouse, like if you grow plants in order to sell them, if you know if you're dealing with a short day plant or a long day plant, you can actually plan to keep your plants in bloom all year just by controlling how much light they have access to. So you can put them in darkness, let's say you have a poinsettia in the summertime, you can just shade them during the long day and make them think that it's nighttime, and you can actually keep them flowering all year round, which is pretty cool. We've already talked about some examples of how plants respond to changes of temperature. Um, one situation is what's called plant dormancy. Dormancy comes from a Latin word which means to sleep. So dormancy is a condition when a plant or a seed remains inactive. So this is the case if maybe the temperature is too cold for the plant to do well. The seed or the plant will sort of slow down. It won't remain active. It won't photosynthesize and it won't metabolize. It'll just sort of slow down until the temperature becomes more favorable. Another response to changes in temperature is the change in leaf color. So hopefully you remember what causes that change in leaf color. Um, during, the winter during the winter months, the temperatures drop and the sun is out less, and so the chlorophyll in leaves starts to break down. The green chlorophyll uh, breaks down and as a result, all of those accessory pigments that are more red and orange and yellow finally get their chance to shine through. And do you remember what these accessory pigments are called? Naturally, they're carotenoids. And finally, a, another response to temperature is the leaf dropping that occurs after the change in leaf color. So sometimes a, a tree will undergo this change in color and then the leaves will altogether fall off. Because if there's not much sun out during the winter, it's not really worthwhile for the plant to keep those leaves on the branches because those leaves take up nutrients and energy. And so changing the leaf color is and uh, dropping the leaves turns out to be a more efficient way for the plant to live during a time when it couldn't really produce much photosynthesis anyway. And finally, our last topic are, is nastic movements. And this is these are plant movements kind of like tropisms, but they're not controlled by the direction of the stimulus. Instead, they're caused by things like hair triggers. So we saw a really awesome video clip with David Attenborough uh, of a uh, Venus flytrap that trapped a fly on the inside. And you see these little hairs here. They're kind of small. But when these hairs are triggered, it means that a fly is on the inside. And so the Venus flytrap will close its specialized leaves and release digestive enzymes that will break down the fly so that the uh, Venus flytrap can get the minerals and the vitamins contained inside the, the body of the fly. Another really cool example of a nastic movement is when this plant here, this is called a mimosa plant, like the drink mimosa. Uh, this is when a mimosa plant closes its leaves in response to touch. So do you remember the video with David Attenborough again? Um, where we saw a caterpillar traveling along these leaves. Now, caterpillars are big threats to leaves because they eat them. This plant, at feeling any kind of pressure, like as might be caused by a caterpillar, will close its leaves. And so very often the caterpillar will try to take a bite, and then all of a sudden the leaf has vanished. What lo used to look like this, a very big, broad leaf, has suddenly become very small and hard to get to. And so this is another example of nastic movements. And that concludes our discussion of plants.